This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. The same religion that's capable of hideous acts of destruction can also be capable of moments of healing, of restoration, and of hope. But educate a girl, and you educate her entire family. There is a sun within every person. When that anger sets in, write it. Write the letters, but don't send them. You never want to leave concrete proof of insanity. I'm Dan Colbert, the executive, the executive Director for the Institute for Energy Efficiency. We're very proud to co-sponsor this lecture with Arts and Lectures. The Institute is about making a difference in the energy equation and helping to bring about a new relationship between people and energy. Bringing in speakers such as Ed Masria is an essential part of this mission. In the overall energy discussion, disproportionate attention has been paid to the transportation sector. In the U.S., though, it is buildings that account for almost half of all carbon emissions and gobble up about 72 percent of all electricity. That is why the Institute for Energy Efficiency has a major initiative in buildings. Thanks in large part to Ed Masria's efforts, the building sector is now beginning to be recognized as the major piece of the energy puzzle that it is. Ed is an internationally recognized architect, author, educator, and visionary. He's the founder of Architecture 2030, an innovative research organization focused on protecting our global environment. He developed and issued the 2030 Challenge, a measured and achievable strategy to dramatically reduce global greenhouse gas, gas emissions and fossil fuel consumption by the year 2030. He speaks nationally and internationally on the subject of architecture, design, energy, and climate change, and has won more awards than we have time to recount here. When I first heard Ed speak at a U.S. Green Building Council meeting about three years ago, he was making an impassioned plea for strengthening the LEED standards, which are issued by the U.S. Uh, GBC. Uh, the lead standards for buildings, particularly in the energy category. I expect that we'll hear a similar passion tonight. So please welcome with me Ed Masria. Uh, thank you very much. It's always nice to be back in Santa Barbara. I have to um, uh, always mention uh, that Santa Barbara was the first city to pass legislation uh, in the country to adopt the 2030 challenge targets, and that um, pushed the state to uh, state of California to become the first state to do that. Um, so kudos to to Santa Barbara. It really, um, uh, really led led the way, and we're now looking at national standards. Uh, so you can be proud uh, proud to know um, uh, that you're really pioneers. And um, I think it was a historic event, uh, um, what happened here in, in Santa Barbara. Um, I want to just run down a list of events that have recently uh, happened and was on the news uh, from today and, and this past week. Uh, today, if you were watching TV, we had uh, Home Depot laid off a few thousand people, John Deere, Caterpillar, all laying off workers. We had Obama pushing his stimulus plan, $825 billion, and another $350 billion in TARP money, which is money left over from the last stimulus. And he's pushing that on Capitol Hill. 
we had news that Antarctica, which was once thought to be building up in snowpack on the interior and actually cooling so global warming wasn't happening as fast, we now have satellite data that shows that for the past 50 years, Antarctica is warming. We just had a report day before yesterday that the tree mortality rate of healthy forests, and not due to bark beetles, has doubled in the last 17 to 20, I think it was 25, 27 years, due to climate change. We had the Obama administration and Obama going on TV today to say the administration is going to let California regulate tailpipe emissions. along with 13 other states uh, that are following California's lead. We had Jim Hansen coming out a few days ago, right after the inauguration, with this statement. James Hansen, Dr. Hansen, is probably our most famous and knowledgeable climate scientist from NASA. And he said these words right after Obama was elected. Obama has four years to save the world. So what do all these things have in common, and why is it all now very personal? I'm going to take you through a journey and hope to answer that question. What are scientists saying? Now, I'm, talking, I'm not talking about the folks on the far left who tie every weather event to climate change, or the folks on the far right who believe the planet is actually cooling, I'm going to talk only about those organizations that we entrust to do the science, the actual scientists that give us the information from NASA, NOAA, the National Center for Atmospheric Research, uh, even the EPA. Only those organizations that we, uh, uh, that we entrust uh, to actually do the research and interpret it and tell us what's going on. They're all saying the same thing. They're saying that we have a problem, that we're off the charts right now. And this is global average temperature and CO2 parts per million in the atmosphere going back 450,000 years. You can see one sits on top of the other. CO2 is a greenhouse gas. So when you have more in the atmosphere, temperature of the Earth gets warmer. When you have less, it gets cooler. Today. We're at 387 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere. We haven't been over 300 parts per million for 450,000 years. We're literally off the charts. And we're increasing at an exponential rate. So we have a problem. And this is what our scientific community is telling us. NASA is telling us that if we keep going like this, by 2050, in lifetime of many of you sitting here, especially the students, by 2050, 25% of all plant and animal species on Earth will be gone. By 2100, that number will rise to 50%. That by 2050, NOAA estimates that many of our coral reefs will be totally bleached, home to 25% of all marine species on the planet. We know that in the West, from the modeling, that we are supposed to dry out dramatically. And that leads to drying out of soils. And the projections are that the acreage taken by forest fires in the West will double to quadruple by the year 2030. We know that warmer temperatures and warmer air temperatures can hold more moisture. And so scientists are telling us that when it rains, it's going to rain a lot harder and a lot faster, leading to flooding interspersed between periods of drought. Scientists have linked hurricane intensity and water content to climate change. And now we know that on Greenland, the mass of Greenland is actually diminishing, leading to more fresh water into the North Atlantic. So what does this mean for the United States? This is the latest graphs 
from NASA on sea level rise. We know that back from the early 1990s, the rate of sea level rise until now has literally doubled. And the doubling is due to ice melt. And scientists have thought that that's mostly from Greenland. And we just got in the latest statistics for 2008, and we're still right on track with doubling. What does this mean for the U.S.? 53%, just like you hear in Santa Barbara, 53% of all Americans live in and around coastal cities and towns. So we're not talking here about Bangladesh. We're talking here about the U.S., and we want to know how does that impact the U.S. And just a few days ago, we learned that Antarctica is now contributing, and especially West Antarctica, to sea level rise because of warming temperatures on that continent. This is a projection, well, no, it's not an actual projection, it's actually a, a, a photograph um, that was taken when Ike was about to strike the coast of Texas. I was in Denver giving a lecture, and I was watching the news as Ike was getting closer and closer, and just before I left to go down to give the lecture, I got on the, um, uh, the, the internet, and downloaded this image of where Ike was at that time, just before I left. In the red box is Galveston, Texas, and you know it was making a beeline for Galveston, Texas, and the projections were that it would push a wall of water up to Galveston, uh, probably about three meters in height, 21 feet. A year before, we had done a study for the city of Galveston and the newspaper in Galveston, on Galveston Island, and what it would take to flood the entire island. Anything between one and a half meters and two meters, and this was the website that was created, and it was in the newspapers in Galveston. So at one and a half to two meters, Galveston was totally flooded, and three meters was coming. So we knew exactly what would happen, and I showed these slides at that conference in Denver, and sure enough, when the, when the um, uh, lecture was over, uh, this is what happened to Galveston. We've done the most extensive sea level rise study in the United States. Our work is used by NOAA and has been presented to the National Academy of Sciences. And I want to take you down the coast very quickly, just a few locations. We've done, we've done literally hundreds of locations. I'm going to take you down just a few to show you what we're in for at one meter of sea level rise. This is not the six meters that was in Inconvenient Truth. This is just one meter, and now we're not talking about Bangladesh. We're talking about the East Coast, the Gulf, and the West Coast. This is Point Pleasant, New Jersey. This is what happens with just a meter of sea level rise. If we move down the coast to Elizabeth City, North Carolina, that's a meter, that's a meter and a half, and at two meters, the entire city is gone. Historic Charleston, South Carolina, that's a meter. It wouldn't survive a meter and a half of sea level rise. Hollywood, Florida, that's just a meter of sea level rise. In fact, the whole coast that side of, New, of uh, Florida uh, is impacted like this. Down at South Beach, historic South Beach and Miami Beach, that's just one meter of sea level rise. It would basically be gone. Over to Tampa, Florida on the Gulf side, it's flooded at one and a half meters of sea level rise, the downtown area is inundated. New Orleans, about 20% of the state of New Orleans, the southern part of the state, is gone with a meter of sea level rise. Up to Foster City in the Bay Area, Silicon Valley area, San Mateo area, that's just a meter of sea level rise. On the other side of the Bay, Union City, 1.75 meters of sea level rise. We've documented hundreds of cities and towns in the U.S., and the situation is the same all along the coast. The U.S. cannot withstand socially, economically, a meter of sea level rise. It would devastate the United States. So what are scientists telling us? How much time do we have? In 2007, the U.N. told us we have seven years, scientific community. Hansen is now telling us We've only got four years left, and if Obama doesn't do it in four years, and he's got to lead the world 
not just the U.S., but he's got to lead the world to deal with climate change. We don't make it. So what's the solution? Well, we got our best people together in our office, and we have some very bright and talented people. We gathered around the table, and we said, okay, let, we got to come up with some solutions here. This is a, a dramatic problem. We're in a crisis. So the first thing we came up with was this. <laughs> However, we know that it took about 100 years to build the ark. And um, so we tossed, we tossed that one out. So we said, okay, let's get serious. And uh, what other options do we have? There really is only one option. And that is that we need to confront the problem. We need to confront it squarely. And we need to confront it honestly. And we need to get to work. And there are many solutions out there. And we'll tell you what we think is the most promising. Climate change, make no mistake, it's an energy problem. And the two go hand in hand. And there are two sides to the energy coin, supply and demand. So which one's the culprit? Well, let's look at the supply side. In essence, there's a silver bullet to the supply side of the energy, of the energy and climate change problem. We've all heard that there's no silver bullet. There's only silver buckshot, and we have to do this and this. And by the time folks are finished telling us what we have to do, we're so confused that we don't know where to go. And we throw up our hands and say it's hopeless. Well, there is a silver bullet. This is coal, oil, and natural gas going back to pre-industrial times, from pre-industrial times to the present. The vertical axis is where we were in pre-industrial times at about 260, 250 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere. On the bottom is CO2 parts per million. We're at 387 parts per million today. That's how much coal, oil, and gas we burn. And that's pushed the line over to the right to 387 parts per million. Now I'm going to show you how much oil, gas, and coal, fossil fuels, reserves, global reserves that we have left to burn, and how far it would push that line over. So there's oil, gas, and now this is coal. It actually doesn't end, just kind of trails off. Look at, look at oil. The rectangles are close to being the same. We're getting close to the peak in oil. Some people actually say we've peaked. Some people say we're going to peak in 2011, 2012. But once you hit the peak of a resource, the price goes up and up and up, and you use less and less and less, and you never actually use up that resource because it gets too expensive, and you find alternatives. Historically, that's the way it goes. We're peaking in oil now. The peak of natural gas is not far behind. Oil and gas cannot fuel climate change. The only fossil fuel left that can fuel global warming is coal. And by that, we mean dirty coal. So the silver bullet is no more coal. If we phase out coal, and we're talking about dirty coal here without carbon capture and sequestration, but carbon capture and sequestration is 20 to 30 years out by our own scientific and engineering community, so it's not a player, actually. But if we phase coal out between now and 2030, no matter how much oil and gas we use, we don't fuel dangerous climate change. It's a silver bullet. But we're not going to phase out coal unless we get the demand for coal off the table. So on the demand side, who's the culprit? Who's, who wants all this coal? Well, we have three sectors. We have the building sector, the transportation sector, and industrial sector. You can put everything into those three bins, pretty much. Of total U.S. energy consumption, buildings consume 48 percent. It's now 50 percent, actually, of total U.S. energy production. 42% is building operations, and 8% is to build the buildings on an annual basis, 
and to make the materials and get them to the site and build the buildings. So 42 percent building operations. U.S. electricity consumption, the demand for coal, the three sectors, buildings consume 76 percent of everything generated at coal plants. So if we want to get coal under control and phase it out, we have to deal with the building sector. So a few years ago, we issued the 2030 challenge, and this is what Santa Barbara adopted as the first city. We called for all new buildings and major renovations to meet an energy consumption performance standard of half the regional or area average for that building type. And since Title 24 is a really good code, it's really 15 or 20 percent better than Title 24. We use now about 42 quads of energy in the building sector. We're projected to increase, just because we build more buildings all the time, we add to the building stock, we're, inspect, we're expected to go to about 52 quads of energy. It's just a unit of energy. We, the total U.S. uses about 100 quads. We're expected to go to 52 quads by the year 2030. If we implement just the 50 percent target for new buildings and renovations, every time we renovate, we reduce energy consumption. Every time we build new, we're adding. We basically have leveled out the building sector. So that's the first part of what we have to do. The 2030 targets then say in 2010 we need to go to a 60 percent reduction, in 2015 70 percent, in 2020 80 percent, in 2025 90 percent, and the reason it's called the 2030 challenge is that we call for all buildings to be carbon neutral or net zero by the year 2030. I'm happy to report that everyone in the building sector, cities, states, has adopted the 2030 challenge, and even Barack Obama made it part of his platform, carbon neutral buildings, by the year 2030. So everything's in place. That that mean, does that mean we're doing it? The answer is no. But at least we have the pieces in place. And California, again, is leading the way with AB 32 by requiring all residential buildings to be net zero by 2020 and all commercial buildings to be net zero by 2030. Now, how did that happen? Well, after we were in Santa Barbara, Christina Kirshner, our director, and I were invited to Sacramento to spend a week. I, I, uh, by the end of the week, I couldn't speak, but we gave seven talks in four days to everyone from the California Energy Commission to legislators. And we brought this with us because we did a little research just before we went. And I just want to present to you what changed California, I think, in the direction of calling for the targets that they're calling for. This is the graphic that we got from California of greenhouse gas emissions in all the different categories. They did their homework, put down what each sector was responsible for. And if you look down at the bottom, the last line is gasoline. And everyone in California knows that the problem is transportation. At least it's one of the problems. Now, when we came, we said, wait a minute, there's no building sector. So let's make a little slice here and call it the building sector and see what it uses in California. We know in other states and other cities it's huge, and the transportation sector is small, for example. Like in New York City, it's 80 percent. Transportation sector is 15 or 20 percent. But what about California? So we said, okay, and I have to put my glasses on. Or no, I can read from here. Let's take imported electricity. How much goes to buildings? Well, we put that in the bar down below. Then we looked at in-state electricity, what you produce in-state, what goes to buildings. And we added that bar. Then we took what energy is burned directly in buildings, in boilers and hot water heaters, with CO2 sent right up the stack. And we put that in there. Then we took commercial buildings, burned directly in commercial buildings, and we added that to the mix. Then we took industrial buildings for HVAC, heating, ventilating, air conditioning, 
and we put that in, and voila, the building sector was just about the same size as the transportation sector. And that's what got the PUC and the California Energy Commission focused not only on transportation, but also on the building sector. And that's how those standards were developed. So how do we meet the 2030 challenge? How difficult is it? Well, we say there are three ways to do it. The first way is design, planning, and innovation. And this is the no cost, low cost, or cost savings option. It's everything from how you site a building, where you put the windows, what color you make the roof, what kind of materials you make it out of, how much insulation you put in the building, whether you use passive solar heating, cooling, or daylighting systems, all those things. You can get the consumption way, way down. This is the Mount Airy Library that we did in 1981, a long time ago. And we daylit that, used passive heating and cooling techniques in North Carolina. Those are two typical buildings, a typical library in North Carolina, a typical office building, and the Mount Airy Library is over to the right. We reduced its energy consumption just through design strategies, no additional budget by 80%. We've done it in housing, we've done it in schools, we've done it in religious facilities, we've done it in an all-glass conservatory, uses 90% less energy than a typical conservatory. We don't want anyone to fail because we can't afford to fail if our scientific community is giving us four or five years. So we say if you can't make it that way, then add technology. We're a lot more sophisticated than we were in 1980 and 81, and there's all sorts of technologies out there from solar hot water, small-scale wind, photovoltaics, that we can add to the building. Now, I know photovoltaics are expensive. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then we say we really can't afford to fail. So if we can't make it in those two ways, then at least make the utility sell you clean power and not coal-generated electricity. And I just put this slide in for some wonderful people I had dinner with tonight. If we want to generate a quad of energy, again, U.S. uses 100 quads, for example, today. If we want to generate one quad, how much would it cost just conventional coal plants at the cost, not the inflated cost today, but at the cost last year? How much would it cost to generate a quad? $122 billion. If we want to generate a new quad of electricity, that's how much it would cost. Now, what about coal with carbon capture and sequestration? We don't really know what the price is, but the last number we had until they canceled the project from FutureGen was $256 billion, but that was going south. So they canceled the project because the cost were, was going up. So that's relatively what we had at that point. If you want to generate a quad using nuclear energy, the last price we had last year was $222 billion, the reason we have a question mark is because that's now increased. And in fact, with nuclear energy, the only contracts that will be signed for a nuclear plant today, and we were talking to the Westinghouse folks a few weeks ago who basically designed the generation plants that we have today that they're trying to put in the U.S., they will have a non, basically a cost plus, no fixed cost contract because they don't know what the cost will be and no time limit on the contract. That's the only contracts they will sign for nuclear plants. What about efficiency? What if we want to take an entire quad out of the building sector by spending money on changing out windows, changing out boilers, putting in better appliances, lighting fixtures, all the things that we have off the shelf at today's cost to get a quad would cost 42 billion dollars. Right now we have about 250, 275 billion square feet of building stock in the U.S. Over the next 30 years, we're going to tear down 52 billion square feet. We're going to renovate another 150 billion square feet of that, and we're going to add an additional 50 billion square feet. So by the year 2039, Three quarters of the built environment in the U.S. will be even either new or renovated. This is a huge market for us. 
And that's where all the jobs are. And that's where we see the stimulus. That's where we'd like to see the stimulus going, and I'll explain that in a minute. This is U.S. electricity consumption in the U.S. That's oil. Only in Hawaii they use oil because that's all they can get to generate electricity. This is nuclear. These are projections from our Energy Information Administration from now until the year 2030. Nuclear is expected to actually go up a bit, but not very much. Natural gas is actually expected to come down in terms of production between now and 2030 because it's getting more and more expensive. And I told you about the peaking problem and the demand on natural gas, so we're expected to use less. Renewables are expected to go up, actually by a few quads. We need to do better than that. But coal is expected to really go up dramatically, and most of that, almost all of it, is due to building operations. We're going to need about another 92 plants. But we can't have that. So if we implement the 2030 challenge targets nationally, which is what we're pushing for now in Congress. And we just incentivize, and I'll show you that in a minute, incentivize efficiency on top, of the co on top of the codes. Then we can phase out coal between now and 2030. And if this administration gets serious about renewables and doubles the amount of renewables we, we would have in place from the projections, actually doubles their projections by 2030, we would actually have enough renewables to take care of the automobile sector, which is now moving to plug-in hybrids, and they're going to demand electricity. And so rather than use them for the building sector, we could use it for the transportation sector and phase out coal. So how do we do it? The American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009, the stimulus plan that Obama is calling for, is 825 billion dollars. The building and renovation part is projected to get about 80 billion. Most of it is in the public building sector. It's schools, recreation centers, government buildings, federal buildings. They're going to tighten all that up. And you heard Obama talk today about how they're going to reduce energy consumption in federal buildings dramatically using the stimulus money. This is the building sector, U.S. building construction. This is the total building construction in the U.S., the total amount of building stock. That's the public building sector, is 7 percent. That's the private building sector, 93 percent. You only have to walk outside and start counting the buildings as you're walking down to see what are public buildings and what are private buildings. Every nine or ten buildings are private buildings, then you come to a public building, then another nine or ten makes sense. The public building sector, school construction this past year increased 6 percent. Government buildings increased 6 percent last year in 2008. It's not the public building sector that's dragging the economy down although it will begin to hurt probably toward the end of 2009 because public building projects were started, the bonding was started a few years ago, and then you had the drawings and everything else. And so you still see a lot of construction going on this year, and you'll see some going on toward till the end of the year. But the beginning part of that sector is now beginning to hurt, and the stimulus is the money is to be used in the public building sector to stem the bleeding, and to not have it exacerbate the entire building sector economy that's dragging everybody down. The private building sector, which is dragging us down, residential construction is down 39 percent. That was in November. It's probably way over 40 percent now in commercial buildings. We're down 17 percent. It's probably more like 20 percent, and it's dragging the economy down. So we put out a two-year, nine million jobs investment plan. And we're telling the administration to invest 
$192 billion in the private building sector. Because when you put the money in the public building sector, you're not really stimulating jobs, you're preventing job loss. And we're all for that, but we need to turn the economy around. What happens if we put the $192 billion, the way we're talking about it, into the private building sector? Well, you stimulate and you create direct non-government spending of a trillion dollars. You create nine million new jobs and you create a new renovation market that's worth $236 billion a year as you go out 15, 20 years, you're in the trillions of dollars, totally new market that's not there today. So how does it work? Well, in the residential sector, what we're saying is the federal government wants to buy down mortgage rates to prevent foreclosures. So you buy down mortgage rates, somebody stays in their building, they're paying less, they have a little more expendable income, everybody rushes out to refi, they have a little more expen expendable income. You didn't create a job except for maybe a mortgage broker or an appraiser. What we're saying is tie the mortgage rate buy down to efficiency standards, energy reduction targets, and really drive it down because it's not that expensive to drive it down. So we say for existing buildings, and we want existing buildings better than new buildings, existing buildings, give somebody a 4% if they get 30% below code. If they go out and they actually renovate their building to 30% below code, give them the renovation money as a construction loan, a bridge loan, or a low interest or a no interest loan using state funds, and give them a 4%. Give them 3.5% three, three at 50% below, 2.5%, 75% low, and if they go carbon neutral, we'll give you a 2% mortgage. In the commercial building sector, we say give the people who are going to renovate their commercial buildings an accelerated depreciation schedule all the way down if they go to carbon neutral of one year. Let them depreciate the whole thing, and when they sell the building, the cost of the renovation, of the efficiency renovation, is not taxable. Now let's go back and look at what this does. Let's look at the residential sector. Let's say you go in and you say, I have a building, I have a house, and I want a 2.5% mortgage. Now I have to get 75% below code. How hard is that? Well, here's my existing home. Let's just take an example, Santa Barbara, for example. Let's say you have a 272,000, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> this is the barrio in LA, maybe, but. Um, but we took this, that's actually the national average mortgage today, home, home today. We know you're not the national average, but you're all above, you're all above average actually in many ways. But let's just take this as an example. Maybe you had a half a million dollar mortgage or a $750,000 mortgage. Numbers are still the same, so you can substitute them in here. But let's take 272 and we'll show you, actually, the, the more expensive your mortgage, the better you make out, and we'll show you that. But this is the average, 272. Some are going to be above, some are going to be below, you're all going to be above. Um, but let's say you refinanced a little while back at 6%, and you have $12,000 equity, not very much because you just recently refi, and your monthly payment is 1632 a month. That's what it is, 6% for a 272 mortgage. Well, let's put that up there. Okay. Now, you, you want a 2.5% mortgage, you got to get 75% below code. Well, how much is it going to cost? Well, we picked an average cost. Maybe the cost here will be more expensive. It won't make a difference. But the average cost is $51,250. So if you want to get it, if the feds are going to give you a 2.5% mortgage, they're going to guarantee the banks, they'll buy those mortgages up. You have to go out and hire someone. to build out $51,250 worth of efficiency. Solar hot water heater, maybe some photovoltaics, you can actually fit that in here in that budget. 
tighten up your windows and doors, new doors, whatever. And then I'm sure you're going to go out and throw in a granite countertop and a few other things that, you, that you've been putting off for years because at 2.5%, it's lucrative. So you're going to actually even spend more money. But let's just say you only spend the 51. Now you've given someone a job. Every mortgage, someone has a job. You can't get the money unless someone's working. Well, if you're going to do it on your own, you'll never put in $51,000 to get $100 less on your energy bill, $150 less on your energy bill. You're not going to spend $51,000. There's no payback. It's 30 years. Along comes Uncle Sam with the stimulus, and he says, we'll give you the 2.5% mortgage, and we'll also throw in a $7,000 solar tax credit, and any other tax credits the city or state will give you, whatever else they want to throw in. But let's just say it's just 7%. We'll give you that if you go and invest $51,000. You can rate it into your mortgage. And we'll give you the loan to do the construction. So now you rate it into your mortgage. Your mortgage has now gone up to $304,000 over 30 years. But your mortgage payment at 2.5%, even with the $51,000 in it, is only $1,203 a month. Who in their right mind would not do this? Now you've put America back to work. And if you go carbon neutral, it's $70,000, but you're at 2%. So you're saving not only on your mortgage $429, but you're saving on average $144 in energy bills a month. That's $574 in every American that takes advantage of this in their pocket. They have more expendable income. They've hired people to do the work. Those people they've hired are paying taxes. It's actually a trillion dollars worth of efficiency. That's apart from the carpet that you were waiting to put in, because, but you wanted to wait a while, and the kitchen that you were going to renovate and everything else, probably more like $2 trillion. The money that comes back to the feds in taxes is way more than what the feds have to put out to buy down the mortgage rate. Now you have a recycling amount that's going into the economy. And think about it. You've spread that money across the entire United States, not one big bridge project in, in, uh, in Massachusetts somewhere. But in every, every homeowner can take advantage of it across the US. We have also weatherization, all sorts of other money in the, in the program to take care of rentals and low-income folks. But this is spread across the entire U.S. and across every single U.S. industry, and it brings them all back from John Deere to Caterpillar to Home Depot to everyone else who's laying, to Pella, who's gone to a four-day work week. Everyone else brings it back. Glass, sealants, paint, you name it, carpet, fabric lighting fixtures, wiring. Every conceivable American industry comes back. But it comes back in a transformative way. We now transform the entire building sector and built environment in the US to where we need to go to stem the dramatic effects of climate change. And we begin to meet Hansen's goal of four years in driving coal or dirty coal out of the picture. So let's just recap. If we put the money into the public building sector, it's high, has high public benefit and value. And we want to do that. But it has limited jobs because you're basically substituting the tax base, which funds public infrastructure. With jobs going south, there's no tax base. All the government is doing is substituting its dollars, which are your, not even your dollars, Chinese dollars, imported dollars, lent us dollars that we borrow for the diminishing tax base. So it's limited jobs, no private spending, except secondary spending, no direct, limited impact. And once the project is built, 
it's not sustainable in terms of the economy, you have to then fund the next infrastructure project because it doesn't fund it. It doesn't build up the tax base. If we look at the private building sector, we create 9 million new jobs, a trillion dollars in private spending in efficiency to get those quads out. Two hundred and thirty six billion new annual renovation market, and that's every year. An efficiency renovation market, by the way, the total renovation market is huge. Forty four to sixty nine billion in energy savings. That's money that we pay that goes right out the window right out the building, and so what we want to do is capture it and put it right back into the economy, put it to work. Right now, that money is not being used. We reduce our consumption by 2.16 quads over two years, a quad a year. 168 million metric tons of CO2 over the two-year period. One trillion cubic feet, just slightly less than a trillion cubic feet of natural gas. We reduce our consumption. We begin moving ourselves toward energy independence. 36 million barrels of oil saved over this two-year period. And we create a tax base so that the plan pays for itself. It actually costs the U.S. government nothing. However, the problem with the U.S. government is they're paying it out of one segment and it's coming back in the other segment and they can't seem to get the idea that you take that money and put it back over here and keep recycling it. They see it going into a different pot and they can't connect the dots. Uh, but we're trying to help them to do that. And if you talk to your congressmen and legislators, tell them to look at the 2030 challenge, 9 million job plan that Architecture 20 is putting out. Because we need all the help we can get. Because if Obama misses this opportunity and the feds drive down interest rates without tying it to efficiency and jobs, we lose those buildings forever. And forever, I mean 15 to 20 years before they'll ever be renovated again. Because you will have gotten such a low interest rate that you can't apply the program and you won't really do anything with the building, you'll hold on to it for 10 to 15 years at 3 or 4% or 2.5% or whatever it is. And so we've taken those buildings out of the economic opportunity to create jobs, and it'll be a disaster. So on the global warming front, this is what the EIA is projecting for global CO2 emissions between now and 2100, and I couldn't even get the 2100 on the graph. It's way off the graph. This, according to NASA, is what happens if we begin now and we phase out conventional coal by the year 2030. We have to get back to 350 parts per million by 2100. It gets us close, but it doesn't get us there 100%. And what NASA came up with is a strategy for reforestation and soil enhancement of uptake of CO2, and that gets us to where we need to be to prevent a planetary disaster. So I ask all of you in Santa Barbara to help us. You helped us before, and we made incredible progress. I ask you to help us again now with the two-year, nine million job stimulus plan to help us push it in Washington, D.C. We'll be going for the next two weeks and spend our entire effort over there to get the administration uh, to see the light. You can go to our website and we'll start uploading information. The new stimulus plan, the one that I just showed you, um, is probably going to be online uh, by tomorrow and you can download it uh, and send it uh, to your congressmen and your senators in California. And believe me, not only is California very powerful on the Hill, your senators and congressmen are incredibly powerful and run a lot of the committees. But the Obama administration has basically taken everyone from California and put it in its administration 
uh, because they know that's where all the talent is. And so there are a, a heck of a lot of folks um, uh, from LBL and all other organizations in California that are now part of the administration. Thank you very much. Thanks for sharing your visionary plan. Um, my question is, you mentioned in the next two weeks you're going to be in Washington, D.C. And um, can you tell us about the intensity of your lobbying efforts, what you're going to be doing there, how we can help, and then also what the largest obstacles are, and um, what, if, what chances do you think the Obama administration will take this and be able to get it past Congress? Yeah. Uh, I think right now we're maybe 20, 30 percent chance we need to get it over the 50 percent mark. Um, uh, so we're going to go, and uh, we're just we're just going to do what we always do. We're going to knock on doors. Uh, we have a we have a presence. Uh, we know uh, uh, quite a few people, um, and we're going to ask people who know people to get us in the door. Uh, so how can you help? You can contact your congressman and your senators. You can tell Feinstein you got to meet with Ed Masri as soon as he gets there next week. Uh, you can tell Barbara Boxer the same thing, uh, and uh, and Waxman. Um, uh, we've, uh, we've met with uh, quite a number of others. Uh, our own senators, uh, uh, Sen Senator Udall now, uh, Tom Udall, and uh, Senator Bing Bingaman are behind us. Um, and, um, uh, but I think, I, I, I'll tell you, I think if California says this is where we want to go, uh, they have such influence now in the country that I think, I think it, it'll be huge. And so any help that anyone here can, can, um, uh, can help us uh, meet directly with representatives and, and, uh, and, uh, and senators from California would be very helpful. And I would, I would urge you to contact them on, on our behalf uh, uh, to basically begin looking at the public, uh, the private building sector. And the money we're talking about is what's called the TARP money. The $825 billion that you heard Obama talking about this morning is basically allocated already. It's allocated to tax breaks. It's allocated to the smart grid. It's allocated uh, to public buildings. It's allocated to weatherization for low-income folks um, uh, and people under a certain income level. Uh, that money is all allocated. I think it'll be very, very difficult, although we'd like to say, okay, hold it. Let's take some of the income tax money, some of the others, and put it toward, um, uh, toward the mortgage rate buy-down. Uh, but it's really the TARP money that's actually targeted to the mortgage rate buy-down. They want to buy down mortgage rates with the TARP money. And the big mistake would be if they buy that down without requiring the developers and the builders and the homeowners to do anything and just get the money. It'll put money in people's pockets for a while, but we will have done nothing to reduce our carbon emissions. We will have done nothing to reduce our energy consumption. We will have done nothing to put people back to work. And I think it's the economists that are driving that because I honestly believe they don't understand the building sector. You said, what are the obstacles? Uh, the obstacles are getting to people. Um, I don't see... Um, we have talked to many people on all sides of the issue, even the National Association of Home Builders, um, who would not be our natural ally, are becoming an ally in this because they not only want to get buildings off the market, they want to get people back to work. We went and met with them in Washington, D.C., and uh, we started out kind of adversarial a little bit, but by the end of the the, um, uh, the evening we were hugging each other. Um, but they were saying how what they're having to deal with now is membership committing suicide because they've lost everything. Um, so any, any program that comes along where you can actually help people, put them back to work, and on top of that, help the environment and the planet um, is a plus. I'm curious about the increased demand for photovoltaics and other supplies that this will create. 
Do you think the industry is ready to scale up to deal with this kind of demand? Um, yes, I think um, the great thing about the United States is if you put a dollar out there, somebody will figure out a way to take it. <laughs> so the answer is yes. I think we'll be able to scale up. And there are a lot of other things that we can do, like shading a west window will replace two photovoltaic panels uh, for cooling. Uh, just that, that's a simple, a simple way to get your uh, consumption down, changing out. Your, there's all sorts of other ways uh, to do it. The great thing about the plan is it does not pick energy technology winners and losers. It gives you a target. And the best thing you can do in the United States is give folks a target and let them figure out how to get there. You'll have so many different ways on how to meet those targets, the best ways will shake out. And that's how you really get innovation. I guess my question is similar. Um, if you're seeing a window for a lot of increased building sector activity in the next, I guess, between now and 2030, something like that, with all these renovations, how would the average person's perception of the job market change? Like, if I've lost my job in something, should I expect to be hired into real estate? or? Right. or building. Uh, my daughter has been trying to get a job now for, lost her job, it's now eight months in New York City. She trains as a, a communications designer. But the answer to that is that our levels in the building sector are so low. Uh, we were building about, um, at a good clip, uh, three years ago, I think, three, four years ago, about five billion square feet of new building every year and renovating about five billion uh, square feet. We're down way down now into the one and a half billion or something like that. Um, I think what our program is designed to do and the numbers that we put in is to bring it back to that level and even and at that level we can make the necessary reductions if that entire 10 billion square feet is looking at efficiency. So we're, um, we're looking to bring back that industry to then bring back all the other industries and to get the country going again, to bring back all the lost jobs uh, that we lost. So I don't think we see a redistribution um, within the total populace. I think we see a redistribution within the building sector itself from just straight out construction and build any piece of garbage uh, to really building high quality buildings that, that, um, that really reduce consumption. Thank you all very, very much.